Hello everyone, good to see you again for those who joined yesterday, good to see those who are new today as well. So for this panel we have uh, a crowd, but I promise it's a fantastic one, so stay tuned. I'll begin by introducing our uh, panelists. We have two, we have actually three authors. First we have Professor Budzinski and um, also Victoria Noskova. Professor Budzinski teaches at the Ilmenau University of Technology and Victoria is a junior researcher at the same institute. And then the second paper will be presented by Professor Siing Kao, who is an assistant professor of economics at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And now moving on to the board members, they don't really need an introduction because I'm sure you all know them. We have first Professor Eleanor Fox, who teaches at NYU, and I'm sure you all know her work on antitrust in developing countries and also uh, her work on antitrust goals. And then we have Professor Douglas Melamed, who teaches at Stanford Law School and has written about topics from the role of antitrust in promoting innovation to the goals of antitrust as well. And now that we've introduced the panelists, let me tell you a bit about how the discussion will look like. First, I'll give the floor to the authors. Then I'll invite the, I'll invite the board members to comment. And after that, I will absolutely abuse my position and ask the first questions, after which I'll open the floor to questions from the audience. And now let's get started. Um, I'll first give the floor to Professor Budzinski and Victoria for eight minutes to present their paper on prospects and limits of merger simulations as a computational antitrust tool. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, so thank you for invitation. And I will start uh, right away. Um, our main research question was um, to consider what are potential promises and limits of application of merger simulation models as an um, antitrust tool for computation uh, uh, antitrust? And uh, in doing so, uh, we first, of course, need to um, address uh, if um, which kind of tool uh, are we talking about. And merger simulation is a tool of computational antitrust which applies uh, modern economic techniques uh, uh, to and econometric methods in order to quantitatively predict post-merger effects uh, based on assumptions which were included in the model um, assumptions regarding pre-merger situation. And um, To give you a bit more insights regarding how this approach works, um, first of all, um, computation authorities or anyone who applies this kind of tool needs to build a model of the market. Uh, both sides, uh, shape of demand is needed and for of competition. Then this model needs to be calibrated created uh, based on pre-merged data which is available uh, from the market. And then as a first step, final simulation takes place with respect uh, to uh, previously done steps. And as the final um, expected outcome, we have post-merger situation, which is predicted based on um, available data and which is supposed to uh, provide us with um, good uh, solid base for decision making in this situation. And um, there are certain reasons uh, why we get additional attention to this kind of tools uh, currently, which are first in industrial economics, and under this, they mean uh, progress in understanding of uh, welfare assessment of mergers. Uh, overall. And uh, in addition to this, progress in calculation methods and computational technologies gave us um, possibility to apply these tools to more sophisticated and complex market environments and uh, technological progress and availability of real market data, of course, contributed to um, making these um, calculations and these predictions more solid uh, for the application. And um, in addition to that, um, in general, um, competition policy directions and competition policy authorities are currently try to also be innovative and employ innovative economic tools, which uh, merger simulation models are, of course, um, 
um, come uh, inclusification, uh, they are a part of these innovative economic tools. And uh, while we provide assessment of um, which prospects, which benefits merger simulation models could bring, we consider certain several dimensions. Uh, first of all, that um, of course this tool is data driven. Um, secondly, that it's supposed to be more neutral and more objective uh, because uh, it applies. Um, it does not apply application of um, any expert opinion during the simulation. Over, of course, as we highlighted in our publication, uh, the ground foundation, the ground models are implying this uh, subjective view as well, which puts uh, this uh, um, positive uh, view on the question. Uh, also, in general, merger simulations models should uh, deliver better predictions of uh, different merger effects, and um, they could also be applied as ex post controlling mechanism. This means that you can also run uh, this simulation after merger took place, and basically you can assess whether predictions were um, correct and also this could be used as a tool for policy learning in this regard. Uh, then we took a look into practical application uh, and over there's a number of these um, positive expectations from application of merger simulation models. Uh, we observed that um, there is no huge um, increase in application of this method. Um, where we would expect uh, this to happen. And also industrial economic perspective tells us, yeah, that's a new uh, innovative tool uh, which could uh, bring lots of benefits, um, should be also widely applied. Um, not really. Uh, what we could identify as trends in application of this tool um, were following things. Uh, first of all, that uh, we already have computational power and application and certain theoretical ground was developed this, since late 1990s, um, that um, mainly this tool was applied by bigger competition authorities, of course, because they have more resources there, and also probably because they already have um, expertise in this uh, area or experience, so it's easier to apply this tool. Uh, for them rather than for other competition authorities. Uh, there is also trend in industry selection, so communication, insurance market, and food sectors were highlighted as um, ones who uh, were analyzed the most with these tools. Um, however, I should notice that um, it was uh, almost never used as a main um, Argumentation in uh, um, in uh, uh, decision uh, for any of mergers, so it was always used as additional tool. That is why availability of descriptions or model setting is comparatively um, low uh, compared to other details on proceeding. Uh, this brought us to the point that. Uh, yeah, overall, there are certain uh, benefits which could be observed. We also see limits of this tool. And um, of course, this puts in the question, um, do they actually really have uh, better predictions of merger effects? Because uh, there are certain ways which could be challenged. So the first is how predictions are done. Is it short run effects uh, or mid or long run effects? Um, what about general? uncertainty of future, and all of these things are addressed in more detail in our paper. Um, so in the end, these are main things which were also um, concentrated our attention on as what is actually limiting application of this um, tool. And um, we address a question of institutional setting for antitrust policy. 
and um, by doing this uh, and taking into account also cost of uh, anti uh, which antitrust authorities have uh, during these proceedings, um, we came to um, several conclusions uh, which are that antitrust uh, the institutional economics perspective tells us that we should expect increasing of application uh, of uh, um, merger simulation models. However, the institutional economics um, provides certain reasons why we do not observe this increase in real world application. And the economic policy perspective provides assessment of alternative policy tools and instruments um, However, this assessment is currently a bit uh, underdeveloped, and um, this is also a certain point to be stressed here. Um, and uh, as an additional point, in our conclusion, we say that yeah, ex post analysis uh, could also imply merger simulation models for perspectives of policy learning. Um, and I'm finishing here with our main statement from our analysis that uh, the institutional design of competition policy proceedings, administrative or court related, is more decisive for the success of a uh, computational instrument um, rather than further enhancement of um, or advancement of methods themselves. For your attention. Thank you very much, Victoria, for this very crisp presentation. I saw Professor Budzinski nodding a couple of times, so I'm sure you captured the crux of your paper there. Now, let's move on to Professor Kao's paper. Uh, I will give you the floor. You also have eight minutes to present your findings. We're looking forward to listening to you. I want to uh, sort of take a step back from what Victoria just presented. Um, he, she actually gave a perfect example of where uh, economic models can be very useful in, in antitrust uh, policy making, right? Um, and previous uh, contributors to the computation antitrust program has also discussed various ways these uh, computational tools can help agencies, um, firms, and also lawyers to, to make, um, to sort of integrate that tools into their uh, current practices. So I think without doubt, uh, we all kind of agree that economic principles are a foundation for sound antitrust policies in um, at a current time and also I think in the future. So um, my previous work uh, was kind of like a this broader agenda. Um, um, I developed a methodology for quantifying the use of economic reasoning in district court cases, um, which includes antitrust and also securities regulation. Um, but the focus back then was more on the variation across judges in their economic sophistication and how that might imply for uh, judicial decision making. Um, but here, I think uh, for this conference, I'm going to focus more on the um, methodology um, and also discuss towards the end how uh, these dictionary based methods can be used not only for understanding the use of economic uh, ideas, but also potentially for other analysis that uh, leverages textual data. Okay. Um, so just, I guess, since I'm uh, really short on, short on time, I'm going to skip a lot of the, uh, uh, really this long history of, of uh, the interplay between economic thinking and uh, antitrust policies. Um, and I guess you're all kind of familiar with uh, the later, latter development from the, uh, the rise of the Chicago School around the 1970s. Um, and then after 1990s, uh, we have the post-Chicago School paradigm where uh, increasingly uh, theories from economics, like game theory, information economics, and also the development of new empirical tools um, are now the common uh, techniques that people use uh, when when they discuss antitrust issues, uh, whether at enforcement agencies or in courts. Right, so uh, my goal in this paper is to apply that methodology to uh, appellate courts and to understand the general trend over years and also um, what we can find 
uh, how judges are acting differently in, in appellate courts versus as in a cert circuit court in terms of their use of economics. Right. Uh, one caveat I would uh, offer at the very beginning is that this me current methodology can only capture the use of sort of the modern economic analysis uh, that are developed uh, after 1970s. Um, I'm not able to say anything about the uh, weather and how intensive the, the previous sort of SCP paradigm that has been developed much earlier, like in 1950s, uh, were adopted. And I think that's still like a black box. And I would I would look forward to future researchers to uh, look into that. And that might challenge our um, conception about the prevalence of Chicago school and whether that's actually a dominating thing. Uh, in, in the history of antitrust. Um, so basically the, the foundation of these measurement exercise is, uh, it comes from uh, prior qualitative research by Posner, Landis, and also uh, Kaplow um, and many others. Uh, so basically the, intu the int intuition here is that um, when judges engage with economic ideas, they are either relying on economic concepts to make a point. Uh, for example, they use cross-price elasticities to, to infer market positions and more market share, market power. Um, or they might also engage with the key components of legal doctrines. For example, when uh, talking about the correct approach to market definition, um, they would resort to economic literature uh, from law uh, and economics to sort of uh, arti articulate those doctrines. Okay. Um, and I think uh, later in the panel discussion, I'll, I'll talk more about why this is important for, for agencies and in a practical way, how is this going to be useful? Um, but now let me just uh, describe the uh, measurement exercise. Okay. So the data that I use in this paper um, are hand collected from a Cheetah Trade Regulation Reporter um, and the sample has 7,000 unique case opinions, which is the universe of appellate uh, opinions published in circuit courts uh, during 1932 to 2016. So this is uh, quite a large data set, and each opinion has um, 1,000 or 2,000 wor words. So that's, that's quite a lot of information to deal with. Um, and then the methodology that I came up with is the very simple uh, tool called the Dictionary of Eighth Method. Um, it, I, don't th I don't think this has been extensively used in computational antitrust, um, but it's definitely one of the uh, like a important tool in computational linguistics and uh, machine learning uh, or in uh, natural language processing and all these. Uh, more recent advances. Uh, the idea is uh, so the workflow works like the following. Uh, first of all, I'm going to pre-process the text data to turn it, uh, the unstructured text data into something that is computable, right? Um, basically, uh, this involves standard procedures like normalizing the text, uh, lemmatization, and then stop word removal. Um, and then in the next step, I define a list of phrases, um, which I call training library, um, that are distinctively characteristic of economic reasoning. Okay. Um, and then finally, I will count the occurrences of these phrases for each opinion, um, uh, adjusting for the, the length of the opinion and also the, um, the probability of each phrase being used in economics uh, training library. So what this looks like uh, from a uh, word cloud is something like this, right? You, you do, um, so for the list of words, I choose a uh, classic industrial organization textbook published in 2000, which synthesized past uh, 20 years of learning of uh, industrial organization. Um, Right, so here you, you see that um, market power, market share, marginal cost um, are quite salient, 
in um, the discussion of economic analysis. Uh, for example, the, the phrase marginal cost has a probability of 0.3% in the entire uh, textbook. Okay. Um, and as, as I demonstrate, um, these economic words are indeed adopted by judges. Right. If, so if I look at the uh, opinion that receives the highest score according to my methodology, then obviously when you read uh, this paragraph, you will immediate, immediately recognize that the judge is uh, talking about market share and then he also refers to past economic literature uh, to corroborate his argument. And that's just one example. And in the paper, I also provided some um, many more examples and also validate the measure extensively using um, prior qualitative accounts as well as uh, judge level variation. Okay, so now um, for once I have the score for each opinion, then I can sort of aggregate uh, on a year a yearly level. Um, here I plot the trend since 1950s. Um, as you can see, there has been a, st a steady increase since 1950s um, and until 1990s, and then things kind of stabilized, right? So this is sort of intuitive and also corresponds to what we understand from, um, from uh, past research. Uh, another key observation I want to make is um, by comparing the words and phrases that, are, that, that this methodology pick up for appellate courts, uh, I can obviously see um, how district judges and appellate judges are using economic uh, differently in their uh, in their opinions. So, for example, district courts tend to, uh, t in the district courts uh, sample we see phrases such as simulation model, uh, measurement error, statistical analysis, and availability of data, um, so on and so forth. So these are often indicative of um, factual evidence being discussed or evaluated in court. Right? There are, th this involves expert testimonies um, from both sides, and then the judges are going to evaluate them. Professor Kao, sorry, this is all fascinating, but you'll have to wrap it up to leave time for discussion. OK, one more, uh, one more slide, and I'll, 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 I'll be done. Yeah. Um, and the uh, appellate courts uh, rely on higher level economic principles to articulate uh, legal doctrines. Right? So and this is reflected in the following words like principles of economics, uh, textbook written by Paul Samuelson, um, and the antitrust paradox by Robert Bork, and so on and so forth. Right, so um, I got to conclude by sort of uh, bringing out this interesting issue um, that I hope we can elaborate more on in the f and, and the panel discussion, which is the the role of uh, antitrust agency and the courts. Um, a recent commentary from a New York Times uh, has the following quote. Okay, so uh, they said to advance a new understanding of antitrust, it is necessary to put a new generation of intellectuals uh, with deep academic expertise in economic regulatory matters into black ropes. Um, so it highlights the sort of the key role that the judges might play in, in antitrust policies. Right? But I think an equally important thing to uh, recognize is uh, whether agency actions or in agency guidelines and narratives can have an important uh, effect on how antitrust law is interpreted in courts. And I think quantification uh, is like one step forward towards uh, answering that question. So um, with that, I would conclude my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kawa. We know the paper is very rich and it's very hard to capture all that richness in eight minutes, but thanks a lot for your presentation. And now after hearing from the authors, let's move on to our rock star board members. Which one of you wants to start with some hot takes for eight minutes? Professor Fox, maybe? Do you wanna take the floor first? I'm sorry, you're on mute. We cannot hear you yet. 
yeah, it's the classical situation. Thank you. Yes, we can hear you now. Good, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for the pre to the presenters with these really interesting papers. Uh, so let me say a few words about the first paper and then the second paper. Um, on the um, simulation models. This is a very good paper. It's very balanced. I liked it a lot. I wanted to focus on what I think might be the strange phenomenon of the simulation models not getting more of an uptake in this era, where, as you point out in your paper, there are more computational tools making the exercise even um, more data, more accurate. Uh, so why is it the case that it is not more popular rather than less popular? And um, and then at the end, I just want to say a word about a possible uh, new usage. So I'm sure that you are correct in taking the pulse of some of the judges in terms of the judges' resistance um, because of the precision precision paradox and the certainty paradox. But I really have a hard time understanding why that should be a big barrier. On the one hand, it could be the case that judges love the models because it puts together a lot of data and information. It is a tool that pulls more together than other tools uh, to do a certain thing, which is limited. Uh, but certainly in terms of showing price rises and in terms of showing price rises in the relatively near term, um, it seems from your paper and others that it is a good and better tool. So why wouldn't judges say, yes, I like the tool and find uh, rather than finding the flaws and discrediting? I think take the HHI. That's a tool. It has lots of limits and it's, you know, wildfire. It's accepted everywhere. So why should it be that HHI is accepted everywhere and this tool not? I wanted to put out one more possibility. I don't think it's in your paper, but maybe I missed it. Um, the possibility uh, that the tool actually does seem biased in favor of the challengers to the mergers in that it virtually always shows a price rise before you put in efficiencies uh, so that the first user is almost always the agency, not the defendants. And then the defendants are shooting at the target where it sees those vulnerabilities, as it certainly did in AT&T, um, Time War uh, T-Mobile. Um, so that is a question. Uh, why does it almost always show the short term price rise? And is that a bias? And is that a reason because it doesn't have the buy in from the, the emerging party side? Um, the institutional barriers, I think, should be able to be overcome if it is a really good tool. Um, my one idea I wanted to put out is this, and you mentioned this in your paper, that there are some new ideas and new values that there is at least rhetoric for trying to put some new values into antitrust and a question whether this makes a merger simulation beside the point or not. I want to propose one area where I think it's very much in point, and that is when there is a loss of welfare, who loses and who wins? And I think this is very much actually demanded today by the enforcers today. They do want to know, do the, do the elites and the better endowed and always better educated keep winning so much more uh, than the poorer population and even the middle class population. In T-Mobile Sprint, actually, there was some evidence, although I think it didn't get to the court, um, but maybe to the FCC, that the big losers were the Sprint customers who were the lower end customers who were willing to pay less 
And they lost a lot, by this prediction, I'm sorry, they would lose a lot more than the winners would win. Um, so I, I leave that there for your very interesting paper, and I want to turn to Professor Chow's paper. So thank you also for your very interesting paper, Professor Chow. Um, here I have two questions and one suggestion. And my question is first, does your, does your work and your project in terms of its output do enough work? And my I come back. My second is, does it actually tell you what you are trying to determine? Then third, I want to make a suggestion. All right, so number one, does it do enough work? Um, don't we actually know that, especially since 1977 with GET Sylvania, when the court said this competition law is about economics and we're not taking account of social values, that the law is about economics. It's not surprising to find economics in decisions. Um, it uh, in cartels, as you point out, there's little economic discussion because they're per se illegal and you wouldn't expect to find them. Mergers, you absolutely expect to find them. And to the greatest extent, and monopoly, you do expect to find them, the economic terms used, but you also will find a lot more about intent and strategy, which might uh, coincide with your finding that you find a little less in monopoly than in mergers. Um, so the question is, don't we know this, that what I think your outcome is, oops, I only have one more minute. Um, don't we know this already? And so why are you doing all this exercise? All right, number two, does it produce, does your project produce what we, what you wanted to produce? Um, do those key words and the word pairs actually produce evidence of something you find useful for the research, which you think is judges relying on economics? The first one and the one that you put on the screen today, Maris against Anheuser-Busch, only says the plaintiff, this is a distributor against a producer, it's a really non-antitrust case situation, and it simply says, the plaintiff is saying this, the plaintiff is saying this, the plaintiff is putting out these economic terms. That's all it says. I would have given that zero. And the second one, uh, which is innovation against Wentworth, which is a competitor suing to stop a merger of competitors, the court says you don't have standing. And if there's a price rise, it would help you not hurt you. I would think that's good economic reasoning. And I would give that a good score. Uh, so I'm really wondering whether you are finding um, what you want to find. Um, now, my third is related to the point, which I meant to make on my point one, that you have a lot of judges using a lot of economic words, and they can come out very differently depending on their own assumptions. So you have in your list both Dolores Sloviter and Robert Bork as having lots of economic stuff in their opinions, words, when we know that they're on the opposite end of the continuum of whether it's libertarian or very aggressive antitrust. So this comes to my last point, which is a suggestion. It would be great if you could use your database to sort out something like um, the judge's assumptions. And this is very difficult, but here's my one suggestion that if you did some pairs like democracy and power, um, while you already are sorting it out, you're already finding what is a lot of economic words like market power, market shares, et cetera. But if you put in democracy and power, it's not 100% sure, but you're more likely to find those pairs on judges like Judge Slobodur, Slobodur, who is talking about using antitrust to promote economic democracy. Thank you for the great papers. Thank you very much, Professor Fox, for these very spot on and tough questions. I'm sure they will lead to a very fruitful discussion. Um, now let's move on to Professor Melamed. You also have eight minutes and we expect equally hot takes from your side as well. Thank you. 
Right. Well, these are very two very interesting papers that I think assemble illuminating data about the influence and use of economic concepts and tools uh, in antitrust cases. It's notable, but not surprising, to learn that economic concepts seem to have been used most frequently as a general matter by judges trained in the Chicago school tradition if they tended to be associated with defendant-friendly outcomes. After all, the push to embed economic reasoning in antitrust law came largely from those who thought that antitrust law had become too friendly to plaintiffs and was in need of more rigor and more emphasis on economic consequences. It's also notable, but not surprising, that as merger simulations have become more complex, data intensive and sophisticated, they have increasingly become a tool of large and wealthier antitrust agencies. The issue of minimum efficient scale in antitrust enforcement and the question of what agencies should do when they lack the resources for taking advantage of sophisticated and costly tools are important and more, more attention. Uh, let me emphasize just one uh, small but I think uh, valuable aspect of the suggestion by professors uh, Rodzinski and Naskova uh, that merger simulations might be used to assess past enforcement decisions. Lookbacks could be used both to assess the enforcement decisions and to, test, to <clears throat> test the reliability of the simulations themselves by examining prices after mergers that were cleared in somewhat oral markets, <coughs> excuse me, which were the subject of simulations to determine whether the simulations accurately predicted what would happen <coughs> and the tools could not be calibrated visibly in part in light of this kind of market uh, testing. So in my few remaining minutes, I want to make two observations about issues that are suggested by these two very interesting papers. First, Professor Kyle has done a good job documenting the extent and frequency of the use of economic terminology and judicial opinions. And I have no doubt that that's a good proxy for the extent and frequency of the discussion of economic topics. But I was struck by her use of the word sophistication. And, and I think my comment here is very similar to what Eleanor Fox was saying. For example, consider the sentence on page 164. Extensive discussions of market definition and its relation to market power are definite, definitive marks of economic sophistication. I'm not sure that's right, because I'm not sure that the frequency and extent of discussion of economic tools and topics correlate very highly to the correct understanding of economics or its sound application in antitrust cases. Like Eleanor, I, as a very preliminary test, read what Professor Cow said was the judicial opinion was with the highest score on economic references, Maris Distribution, and the opinion with the lowest score, Novation Ventures. Maris Distribution turned largely on market power, and the court made several statements about market power that I think might reasonably be called idiotic, because the court and the parties did not connect the numbers and the data with any coherent theory of the case. Novation Ventures, by contrast, said little about economics because it didn't have to. It reached a clearly correct result based on application of sound legal principles to the theory of the case. So what I worry about, as Professor Cow suggests, and the Supreme Court's case, American Express case, might illustrate, is whether antitrust law has become too complex for generalist judges, and whether economic ideas often serve as a glittery talisman that leads courts astray or provides cover for preconceptions, sort of, now let's use the jargon so we don't really have to think very hard. So that brings me to my second thought. Economics is used in antitrust law in two very different ways. One, which is what professors Wyszynski and Naskeva are focused on, entails the use of economics as a tool to solve a fact question. In their paper, that question is what will happen to prices if the merge is consummated. Professor Cobb's data suggests, as one would expect, that this use of economics is relatively more important in trial courts than in appellate courts. Conceptually, that kind of use of sophisticated technical analysis and expert testimony is not unique to antitrust law. 
It's, it's ubiquitous. Forensic tools in criminal law, engineering analysis in patent disputes and disputes about contract breaches, various kinds of tort controversies, financial analyses and security and bankruptcy law, damages calculations, and on and on. Now, there may be important questions about the use of tools that are so costly that they're available only to the wealthy or the plaintiffs or defendants. Are we better off having more enlightened and accurate judicial decisions in some cases, even if not all litigants could take advantage of them or even defend against them? And there may be important questions about the use of tools that are so sophisticated that they do not really help lay judges reach more accurate decisions. Would we be better off not using them or developing different institutions that can take advantage of them? Maybe special, especially trained masters or court appointed experts and especially expert tribunals. But these questions are not unique to antitrust law. What is unique is a very different way in which antitrust law also uses economics as an input into the formulation of, uh, and as a series of propositions embedded in legal doctrine itself. In other words, in this usage, economics is not used to solve a factual question like what will happen to prices. It's used to solve a legal question. What is the law or what ought the law to be? There's a long list of what Daniel Francis calls micro rules, uh, doctrinal propositions that are informed and determined by economic analysis. What is predatory pricing? What is a market? What's the test for loyalty discounts? Uh, and so forth. My guess is that this legal usage accounts for much of the data that are the subject of Professor Kao's paper. And it raises a number of challenging institutional questions, such as, what is the impact of contingent economic propositions on the significance of legal precedence in antitrust law on stare decisis and on the common law like evolution of antitrust law? Who decides when an economic proposition is sound enough to be the basis of a legal rule or is no longer sound? And how does she decide that? And the ultimate question about this usage of economics, it seems to me, is whether economics has made antitrust law so arcane and complex that it has not only become undemocratic in the sense claimed by its populist critics, but more important, has gotten to the point that it has reduced the ability of lay judges to reach economically sound decisions. Does antitrust law need to be simplified to deal with the advances in economic thinking? I have some thoughts about this, but they would think as far afield from today's papers. Instead, let me close simply with this. I completely agree with Professors Budzinski and Noska that the institutions matter. Sound legal and economic wizardry are not enough if the institutions cannot make good use of them. We need to think hard, therefore, both about strengthening the institutions and about adapting legal theory and economic tools to the practical limitation of legal institutions run by human beings. Thank you very much, Professor Melamed, for this very spot on and sharp questions which are very much aligned with your overall expertise and research agenda. We are very lucky to have both you and Professor Fox commenting on these papers. Now, I know we re received enough questions to be discussing this until midnight probably, but I will give each of the authors a maximum of two minutes to react very quickly. What are your gut feelings to what you've heard? Who wants to start? Professor Budzinski, maybe we haven't heard from you yet, so go ahead. Yeah, so very nice to see you all, Ellen, especially to see you after uh, a couple of years to see you again. Very great. Um, and thank you for, for all the wonderful remarks that, that I um, mostly fully um, agree with. Um, just to, 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 to focus on, I think, on the questions that can be answered in these incredible laws, a small time of two minutes. Um, do merger simulation models um, always or mostly lead to rising prices before efficiencies come into account. Actually not. Uh, we have another paper where we, where, where a member of my team uh, looked very closely into ex post studies. And what we can actually see is that in many cases uh, of, of merger simulations also, uh, actually prices uh, already uh, in the first step go down. So it's, it's, it's certainly the case that in the more prominent cases in front of the courts, uh, 
they are there because the prices rise in the simulation. Um, but if if we if we have a more larger set uh, of cases, then actually simulation also predicts falling prices. So it's it's a bit a question of the sample that that you select. And of course, the controversial cases in front of the courts are there because agencies saw rising prices in the in the simulation models. Um, a very intriguing point that I definitely have to take up is how we could think more when, when we when we find a loss in welfare, how we can think more about who are the losers and who are the winners and how this is related to income distribution in society. Um, that That's a very interesting angle. Um, with many cases, I think that um, antitrust is actually something which is more valuable to poor people than to rich people. Um, and um, this is a bit of my gut feeling, but I, I have a couple of reasonings in my head, but they would definitely take longer than two minutes if I start to explore them. But I think that this is the direction is that actually um, to, 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 to go a bit back also a bit back to auto liberalism, this old German tradition that actually antitrust policy is a form of social policy. If we actually go into, into, into this and look at which kind, uh, which parts of the population benefit more and which benefit less from a strict antitrust policy. You know? So, uh, I think we, we have to explore that more closely. And, um, Maybe just a quick remark, because I think the two minutes are already over, uh, to uh, Professor um, uh, Melamed's uh, comments, which I uh, fully agree with. My personal, uh, my preference for using economics and antitrust law would be to use economics to shape laws that are easy to apply um, and uh, economics inform what should be uh, prohibited or what should be sharply looked at and what not and use the economics for, for making the laws better, the institutions better, and not so much to, to use it for having long expert debates in front of the courts. But that's also a bit of a simplifying answer due to the time, of course. Thank you thank very much. Great thank comments. You very much, Professor Budzinski, I love that you put the poor on the antitrust map. It's something we should talk about more for sure. Victoria, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks a lot uh, for your comments. Really insightful. I also wrote them down. And uh, since Professor Budzinski already addressed a couple of questions, I have only one thing to stress um, out is um, what I wrote down regarding um, comparison between uh, standards of proof uh, in different areas and that's sometimes not only unique for antitrust policy application of these uh, computational tools and other types of tools, uh, we basically see um, kind of uh, increased standard of proof for these computational methods in comparison to other methods uh, from other areas. Uh, for example, there will be never accuracy of 99% as the fingerprint, right? Uh, in these kind of uh, computational methods and merger simulation models. Uh, so I thought this is um, one thing um, which was supposed to be mentioned here. Thank you for your comments. Thanks so much for that very quick response. Very much appreciated. Professor Kawa, two minutes. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so uh, first, I want to uh, really thank you to Professor Fox and uh, Professor Malamed for the insightful comments. And um, there are uh, indeed uh, very sharp questions and also things that I've, I have uh, encountered before. So um, I, I would like to first of all uh, respond to um, both of your uh, question on. Uh, whether this measurement uh, methodology is able to tell you um, how good that economic reasoning is, um, so, and unfortunately, this is not. A, this is not uh, my my method is not going. It's not able to capture the like how good or uh, whether that's economics applied in the right way to a particular case. Um, so in the end, this is only capturing if. Uh, judge mentions these words, and the, some uh, mention more of these and some less. Um, it's not clear that they are using it in the right way. So uh, I'm not making a um, 
statement about about the quality of economic reasoning. Um, although I think there's uh, like a recent paper by uh, Alan Ash Dan Chen of Naidu who uh, um, who who find that judges who attend um, like a law and economics training program uh, turn out to use more economics language. And I think sort of consist, uh, like I would say in line with their uh, story here, the, the thing is not like they are, um, after they took those training courses, they immediately get better in, in law and economics understanding and so on and so forth, but rather they, they might just simply pick up those languages, right? So um, I don't, I, um, I, I don't, I don't think I'm, I'm making uh, that kind of judgment on, on, on whether the, the economics are, are sound um, or not. Um, and then regarding the, the, uh, the other, uh, so both of you mentioned um, the examples that I highlighted, like the uh, highest score opinion and the lowest ones that are not comparable. And one is really not uh, discussing a substantive antitrust issue. Um, and I think that's, to that's uh, Absolutely correct. Um, and so in this, um, I guess in this paper, I in this computational antitrust paper, um, I haven't really talked about the like the judge sort of design. Um, but the idea is that in the if you um, aggregate sort of do the analysis at the judge level, then the key uh, design is you need to uh, take account of the randomization that takes place in the court. So within each district court, um, the cases are randomized to those judges. So on average, they are seeing comparable cases. Um, and also in the sample, I take out all the cases that are um, either on venue, um, on jurisdiction, uh, those non-substantive antitrust issues. So in the end, um, if we buy the if the assumption of uh, randomization works, uh, which I verify in the data. Then um, we can still compare judges who, fa when facing similar mix of cases, uh, use more or less economics language. Um, I I call it economic sophistication, but I think the 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 more rigorous term would just be uh, familiarity with economics language. Um, I think that's that's the right interpretation. Thank you very much for these yeah. quick remarks. Um, because we have a panel with agencies coming up next, I would like to ask our authors if the agencies would want to implement the tools you discuss in your articles, where should they start? What should they do? How would these tools help them? Maybe a quick one minute answer from each of you. Yeah, well, um, if, if they want to, to use that, they should first think whether they really want to use it. Uh, in my opinion, um, not because the instrument isn't good, but because it's it's a sophisticated instrument that requires a lot of expertise. Um, and um, as we talk uh, about um, antitrust authorities in the US or Canada or Europe or whatever, this is certainly not much of a problem. But of course, we have lots of antitrust authorities around the world. I think last time counting, we were something around 130 or more countries in the world with antitrust authorities. And many of them um, are not as well as equipped as the big ones in Europe uh, in North America, and uh, I don't think it it would be the first instrument to look at uh, if if you want to protect competition or what becomes more and more uh, fashionable to to generate competition uh, in sclerotic markets. It's really more for the for the sophisticated end uh, because if you if you if you do it but not do it well, then you may actually cause more harm than good. That's a great insight. Thank you. Victoria, do you want to add something or should we move on to Professor Kao? Okay, I'll go next. Um, so I think the, uh, this this uh, computational interest paper, um, I provide a sort of a dictionary-based uh, method, which 
I think uh, if you just view it as a legal analytics tool, so you can apply that tool to extract uh, useful information. And in my case, it will be to identify uh, instances when economic reasoning or economic arguments are being made, uh, whether in district courts evaluating the facts or in uh, appellate courts like uh, articulating legal principles and uh, addressing doctrinal issues. Um, uh, it's it's very simple, and I think in the past uh, we have seen a lot of uh, work in computational law uh, using topic models. Uh, and and in my in my paper, I there was a paragraph where I, I do compare the dictionary based methods with uh, topic models. And the the takeaway here is that uh, in some cases, uh, for example, in my context, topic model is not going to work because um, there is just not a single topic called economic analysis that you can separately identify from these um, uh, texts. Uh, as an alternative, uh, if you have enough background information, if the, you have knowledge about antitrust, and as the agencies do have, then you can certainly um, like come up with a training library, like a predefined list of terms that you think are capturing the important information that you are looking for. Then uh, this uh, dictionary based method can be a, a useful addition to the uh, computational uh, toolbox. That's, that will be my, uh, my takeaway from, from this uh, discussion. Thanks a lot for those tips. I'm sure the agencies will benefit from them a lot. And now just to make the most out of having Professor Fox and Professor Melamed with us, I will turn on to them and ask each a question. So Professor Fox, you have previously expressed criticism towards the Chicago School of Economics, precisely towards its efficiency-based goals. We see in Professor Kawa's paper how the Chicago School has spread out in judicial reasoning. Do you think that we could perhaps use the same approach to spread out a new school of antitrust economic thought? How would that look like? I'm sorry, you're on mute again. Yes, so, so first of all, I, I, I do not oppose economic reasoning. I have opposed certain very libertarian type assumptions, which I think are unrealistic. Um, I think that the various tools, and I would say here it's mostly of the two presented today, it would be the simulation. Um, I think they can definitely go far if they're if they are more accepted and not too expensive. That is a problem uh, because they do do something that is a simpler presentation of putting a lot of data together. And here in my last half minute, I just want to draw on something that Doug Mellum had said, because I think that issue he raised about the over complexity of, the, of economics is such a huge issue today and how to get to a simpler way to decide the cases, even though using good economics is one of the biggest challenges in our antitrust law today. And so for those of you looking to do more research, whether it's with these tools or others, I really recommend the area. Thanks so much for those insights. Professor Melamed, you are a supporter of the consumer welfare standard and you've recently written a defense of the standard for digital markets. Do you think that the merger simulation tool we've seen presented today could make the standard more workable or maybe even reinforce it? The short answer is yes. I mean, look, antitrust law avoidably, uh, unavoidably has a lot of uncertainty. Uh, antitrust decision makers are regularly asked to make decisions about things that are really unknowable. You know, what, what will be the effect of this transaction on innovation or on crisis? So the kind of tools you're, you're, you're talking about in your question that we've been discussing for the last hour are tools that I think had enormous potential, have been proven already in the past, and they're, and they're getting better and better over time, to increase the accuracy of decisions and projections under conditions of uncertainty. And the law has a choice. You know, it can either default to um, the inaction in the presence of uncertainty, but that would render antitrust largely useless, or it can be willing to make decisions under conditions of uncertainty. And if it does that, which it should, then any, any tools that can reduce the degree of uncertainty are improving the quality, improving the quality of the law. I, I, I don't have any, any doubts about that, but I am concerned if I can, if it's for one more moment here, about what may be a, an unstated premise. Uh, in your question, which is that the consumer welfare standard requires measuring and proving specific consumer harms like price increases. 
The consumer welfare standard includes no such requirement. It does not require identifying and proving specific harms to anyone, and it's not focused exclusively on consumers. The consumer welfare standard requires proving only two things. An increase of market power, number one. Two, as a result of anti-competitive conduct. If a plaintiff proves those two things, harm to the trading partners, whether suppliers or consumers, is presumed. It follows from economics, definition of market power, being profitably able to act in the detriment of your trading partner, you can presume he's going to do that. Um, uh, evidence of these effects can be relevant in some cases, but they're not required. And I, 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 I emphasize this because, and this has been clear, by the way, from cases since 1912 and through the Microsoft case and many, many others. Um, but I, I, I emphasize this because I think the idea that specific consumer harm must be identified and then proven by the plaintiff is a trope of the populist critics of the consumer welfare standard. It's wrong, and it has led a lot of commentators and even some courts astray, I think. Thank you very much, Professor Melamed, for this very sharp clarification of what consumer welfare means and what it doesn't. We really need this given the current debates about the meaning of the standard. I'd like to thank everyone for this terrific panel. It's been a pleasure to have our rock star board members with us, also our authors. It was a thrilling discussion. I'm sure everybody took lots of notes from what we discussed, and I'm sure it will lead to many, many more interesting research papers on these topics in the future. <laughs>